My name is John Beckett. Uh, I'm here at the R.W. Beckett Corporation in Elyria, Ohio. Uh, I'll be saying a little bit more about the company and its role with IFA later, but uh, I'm uh, here to just talk a little bit about the founding of IFA. We're actually here on kind of a snowy December day in Ohio, and it was just over 40 years ago on Thanksgiving weekend that IFA was founded. I uh, told a little of this story at a 40th anniversary celebration of IFA in Virginia uh, just uh, a short while ago, and uh, some of the people there encouraged me to uh, record the uh, early years of IFA for posterity or whatever uh, ultimate purpose it might serve, so I'm, I'm privileged to do that. Uh, IFA was actually founded uh, out of a conference that was held in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida uh, over Thanksgiving weekend in 1973. Uh, the uh, memories of that are just very vivid to me and uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I recall that uh, the two principal speakers at that conference were Derek Prince and Ern Baxter. It's interesting that the two of them who later factored very large in the life of IFA and in my own life, had never met each other before. They were aware of each other, but uh, they only at a distance. And what happened earlier in 1973 that uh, worked into the, the actual content of that conference was that uh, Derek Prince had written a book called Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. He had done that uh, coming out of an invitation that he'd received a few years earlier to speak in Plymouth, Massachusetts at the 350th anniversary of the Pilgrim's Landing. Of course, that was in 1620. And so 350 years later, in 1970, he was, he was uh, uh, one of the speakers at a commemorative event in Plymouth. In preparation for that, he studied on the uh, early history of the pilgrims and he realized how significant prayer and fasting was in the formation of our country. And so that motivated him to write uh, a book which has become very instrumental in the life and history of IFA. I'll say more about that book in a minute. Now, Ern Baxter, on the other hand, was pastoring the largest church in Western Canada. And he'd been away for the summer uh, of that year, 1973. And uh, when he came back, he was doing a debrief with the elders of his church. And uh, almost in passing, along with other things, they said, and we formed intercessors for Canada. And he straightened up in his chair and said, you what? And so they told the story of how uh, a, an evangelist from the south of England, Dennis Clark, had come to Canada that summer. And as he came uh, through their church and met with the elders, he talked about what God was doing in other countries, in Denmark and Australia, and that intercessors for, fill in the blank, uh, had formed in several other country, countries. And so the uh, elders of the church said, well, why not for us and why not for Canada? So uh, Intercessors for, for Canada was initially formed out of Ern Baxter's church uh, that summer. So when the two men, uh, Ern in Western Canada and Derek in the southeastern U.S. and in Florida, spoke with each other in preparation for this conference, it was clear to them that uh, there needed to be a, a, a convergence of what was on both of their hearts, namely praying for the nations. And so that is how the theme of that particular conference was formed. Well, uh, it was uh, a, a tremendous experience being at that conference with a large number of people and hearing both of these men speak on the theme of prayer for the nations and just how uh, dramatically that could shape uh, the history of nations. At the conclusion of the formal presentations, uh, Derek, along with the other leadership of the conference, said, you know, we can't just let this 
um, <laughs> die at this point. There, there needs to be an opportunity for people to express an interest if they want to uh, somehow further engage this matter of prayer for nations. And so an invitation was offered. As I recall, there were close to 70 people uh, who, who indicated a desire out of that uh, invitation to somehow be involved in follow-up. Well, what does the conference leadership do with this sort of expression of interest? They actually went through uh, the, the, the people who had so indicated and uh, at their prerogative selected six people who they felt could be kind of a, a shepherding group to at least take the next step with that. That uh, initial group became the board ultimately of Intercessors for America in the early days. I'm, um, I'm privileged actually to have uh, a copy of Derek's book, Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting, that I had taken to that conference. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what my purpose in taking it, maybe it was to get Derek's <laughs> signature or something, but uh, in the light of what happened, I uh, had each of those six men sign uh, this book, and uh, separately we can get a, a close-up shot of this, but these are the signatures of, uh, of the six of us, and the date is uh, November 24, 1973. So it really marks the official date uh, on which IFA was founded. And uh, so John Hurd, Jay Fesperman, George Gillies, John Talcott Jr., Derek Prince, and myself. And uh, so we, we didn't know what we had undertaken really, but John Talcott, a, uh, a, a person of stature and means living in Massachusetts, was asked to uh, provide the initial coordination and leadership for our group. And uh, so before long, uh, John and his wife Rosalind were uh, preparing a newsletter that would go out to uh, whatever people were, were interested in following up on this. It's interesting that uh, they actually worked off the dining room table in their home in, uh, in Plymouth and uh, the, the two of them, uh, probably just completely outside their comfort zone, found themselves with a little publishing empire. Now, a person who was very key uh, in helping facilitate all of that was Gary Burgle. Gary was in the uh, meeting in Florida and was one of, uh, of those 70 or so people uh, who really felt challenged to follow up and do something about this. And he, along with many, many others who indicated an interest, became kind of a, a, of a on the ground network of people who would be involved in, in, uh, in, in, in organizing things at state and local levels and, uh, and helping carry this vision forward. Gary in particular though played another role and that was kind of editor-in-chief of the initial newsletters and uh, the copy would be sent from Massachusetts to Kalamazoo, Michigan where Gary lived and uh, he would cut and paste and do all the kinds of things that we had to do before you know, electronic means of, of editing and, uh, and, and just did a masterful job of, uh, of putting the newsletter into uh, a form that was, was, was credible and uh, uh, a, a, a keen instrument for believers to start connecting around this idea of a prayer and fasting for our nation. Well, um, the, uh, the newsletter began going out, as I recall, uh, within the next year or so, we had uh, perhaps as many as a couple thousand people who were receiving the newsletter. It's interesting that uh, that year, 1973, was significant in a number of regards. Uh, the passage of Roe v. Wade, for example, uh, on January 22nd of that year had really alerted uh, large numbers of people to the fact that uh, our, our nation was 
going in directions that were just antithetical to, to who we were as a, as a people. And um, other things layered in on top of that, the Vietnam War and its legacy, the emerging Watergate uh, situation, uh, energy crises in the Middle East. And, and so people were being sensitized to the need for prayer for our nation, really quite apart from anything that IFA was doing. We were just kind of a catalyst to help uh, bring some, some, some form and content to this. But the, uh, uh, the, 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 the motive of doing something was such that a senator from Oregon, uh, Mark Hatfield, was able to introduce into the U.S. Senate a resolution declaring April 29, 1974, as a day of humiliation, repentance, and prayer for our nation. Well, uh, amazingly, that resolution passed the U.S. Senate unanimously. When it got over to the House, it got stuck in the ju Judiciary Committee, and, and it never got out as a as a piece of, of permanent legislation. However, Jimmy Owens, who later wrote the wonderful musical, If My People, and, and became an IFA board member, was really challenged, actually, in, in Jack Hayford's church uh, at that same time, at the end of April 1974, to have a day that would not only be in times of crisis, but would be a regular time for fasting and prayer. And it was out of that that the concept of the first Friday prayer time uh, emerged. What Jimmy set in motion actually became adopted on a much broader basis in a conference that was held uh, among leadership. It was called a, a summit conference uh, in the fall of that year. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in 1974, and the resolution coming out of that conference, and it involved hundreds of different church organizations, was that through the nation's bicentennial, uh, which was just over a year away at that point, uh, there would be a regular time, uh, once a month, of repentance, prayer, and fasting for our nation. So it was really a landmark declaration uh, by church leaders following up on the initiative that Mark Hatfield had taken. So, um, in that uh, following year, there were initiatives of various sorts. Uh, the people who had been in Fort Lauderdale really were doing things on the ground. There were some state networks that were being developed. And uh, our initial group uh, met a few times over uh, that period. Uh, I, for one, was asked to take some regional responsibility for Ohio and states surrounding Ohio. And frankly, I found myself very frustrated that I wasn't uh, accomplishing all that much in terms of, of uh, developing uh, a network or an organization. And in September, uh, now a year later, of 1975, I uh, attended what was called the National Men's Shepherding Conference in Kansas City. And as part of that conference, we had a, a board meeting arranged. I actually went to that board meeting with a, a letter of resignation in my pocket. And at one point spoke with John Talcott and I said, I just don't feel that I'm doing uh, the, the job that I should be doing and uh, I think maybe somebody else should take on this responsibility. And John, in his just very <laughs> kindly New England way, said, um, well, just, just hold off on that. Let's, let's just not rush into anything. Well, after that board meeting, uh, and without any official action being taken, I was literally walking between the hotel where we met and uh, another location in Kansas City, and Derek Prince, who had been unable to attend that board meeting, kind of fell into lockstep with me, and as we were walking uh, across a square, I remember his responding to my uh, quick summary of what had happened in the meeting by saying, isn't it curious that something that's so significant 
is basically being handled out of people's uh, back pockets, in other words, in their spare time. Well, that comment uh, went in one ear and out the other at that time. That was to change. Later that evening, uh, as a very large assembly was together, uh, and, uh, and, and Ern Baxter spoke in, in the most powerful and compelling ways, I felt the Lord spoke to me and challenged me to do something uh, for the nation's bicentennial that was well out of my comfort zone. And uh, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know whether it was to go into a closet and pray or, or to, to do something um, other than that, but I knew I was to do something. And so uh, two weeks later, I flew out to Plymouth, Massachusetts, where I met with John Talcott. My wife Wendy was with me, and we were just we were seeking the Lord to know what this would mean. In conversations with John and Rosalind Talcott, uh, it became apparent that they were uh, not overwhelmed really, but just uh, struggling to maintain uh, what they were doing from their their home in, in Massachusetts. And it became apparent that we could contribute something to the future of IFA by literally moving that office from uh, their home in Plymouth to our corporate offices in Ohio. Now, uh, we agreed to do that. Uh, the actual move was made at the end of December in 1975. I decided I would take a partial leave of absence from my CEO position in our family business. I didn't know for how long, but I was just going to do all that I could to serve this effort and to serve our nation uh, during our bicentennial year. Interestingly enough, uh, my father, when he designed our corporate offices, had built on the second level of our offices watchman's quarters. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> The watchman's quarters were designed so that if we got into any kind of military support activity, as we had not that many years earlier during World War II, we would have facilities for a night watchman. Well, uh, perhaps prophetically, those same quarters became used as the headquarters offices for Intercessors for America for the next quite a few years. And uh, I uh, uh, was able to uh, involve a person, a wonderful person uh, by the name of Kathy Kump to uh, assist in some of the office activities. Uh, we had a few other uh, support ac uh, people during that time and I, I just donated a lot of my time to helping take what was a solid concept and making it accessible to more people. And uh, I remember through a series of magazine ads that we ran uh, the, the, the challenging headline in those magazine uh, ads was, how will Christians respond in our bicentennial year? We actually ramped up the number of people involved from something under 3,000 to 50,000 people within a matter of months. It was amazing. People were ready to do something to pray for our nation and its future. So uh, we saw this momentum uh, building, developing, and uh, by August of that same year, 1976, uh, it became apparent that we, we needed to set things in place for a longer term involvement. And Kathy Kump's husband, Guy, who had been working for our company in a production control role, uh, stepped forward to become the first full-time executive director of IFA. And uh, so, uh, at that point, we were now more fully structured as an organization and we're really gearing to do all that we could uh, through, through this bicentennial year. I, um, I remember that um, the, 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 the nation was, was uh, just mobilized around the significance of prayer and in uh, the latter part of that year, just even as we saw that IFA needed to have a, a longer lifespan, uh, the concept of marking a day, which uh, has been perpetuated ever since, of the first Friday of every month being a set aside for, for prayer and fasting, 
uh, became an important part of, of IFA's legacy, I believe, to the nation. Well, um, there's so much more that could be uh, said about those early days, and uh, Sally Fesperman would be the other person who is so keenly aware, along with Gary Burgle, of what occurred during that time. And uh, Sally and Gary, if you're watching this, I hope I haven't misrepresented misrep things too much, but it was, uh, it, it was an electric period, and I was so privileged to, uh, to be involved in that. So I hope this uh, little history of those first three years uh, will serve IFA well, and uh, I'm sure there are lots of, of uh, blank spaces that can be filled in, but uh, the significance of what happened during that period of time, really, I believe, a, a powerful move of the Holy Spirit coming out of a Christian teaching conference and, and uh, a, a small group of people in proportion to our national population uh, just kind of moving in obedience to, to do something that would be uh, a, a legacy for our nation and would influence its destiny through prayer uh, has become, uh, I think, an important part of the history of our nation for the last 40 years. We're grateful to the staff in Washington uh, because it was later the offices moved to Washington. Uh, Gary took on a much larger role. He's now been succeeded by uh, Dave Kubel and his staff. Uh, and we're poised to continue to press forward uh, with the focus theme of uniting Americans uh, in prayer and fasting for our nation. Thank you. God bless you.